half in the bag. We'll let the dogs out. Huh. What's so interesting? Well, I read this entire book only to get to the end and find out that ghosts aren't real. Guess I am a dummy. Uh, Mike, since you're done with that book, do you want to go see a movie? Sure, Jay. How about we go see Birds of Prey? Nah. Hmm, would you have any more interest in that movie if they changed the title? Nah. How about the Sonic movie? Nah. Oh, would you have any more interest in seeing the Sonic movie if they changed the graphics? Nah. Oh, well, how about Cats? Nah. Oh, would you have any more interest in seeing it if I told you they improved the special effects? Nah. Well, since there's no new movies worth seeing, uh, maybe we can talk about a couple movies that came out months ago. One that nobody saw, and one that now everybody's going to pretend that they already saw. <laughs> oh, Jay. I saw Doctor Sleep months before the Oscars. I mean, Paris. When I was a kid, there was a place. Doctor Sleep is both an adaptation of the Stephen King novel and a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's 1980 film The Shining. The Stephen King novel is also a sequel to his other novel, The Shining, but The Shining book and The Shining movie are very, very different. And somehow Doctor Sleep is a sequel to both the book and the movie? Hey, remember that part in the Kubrick movie where Shelley Duvall walks past the room and a guy in a dog costume is giving a blowjob to some dude? What was that about? Oh my gosh, there's a chapter in here about what to do if you're stuck in a haunted hotel. Oh my lord. With ghosts from all centuries there to feast on your fear. Health hazards from ghost hunting, allergies, dust and mold. Does it anything about uh, asbestos? About vision and how he got haunted so hard that he had to wear glasses. He got haunted so hard by a demon that it fucked his vision up. He was definitely haunted by a ghost so hard that it ruined his vision. Jay, you simpleton! It wasn't a ghost; it was a demon. Oh, oh! Now we're here to talk about ghosts. We're here to talk about the belated sequel to The Shining. Yes. Um, um, Nobody saw this movie in theaters. It, it came and went and flopped pretty hard. It was weird because you mentioned it and I was like, well, I wonder when Dr. Sleep comes out. And it had been out for, for months. Yeah. And I was, oh. There wasn't a lot of marketing behind it. And I think, uh, it, it's funny, speaking of title changes and how the Birds of Prey movie, they're so desperate to get people to see it that they changed, no, it's Harley Quinn now. You know that name. Mm -hmm. And I think that was part of the thing is this movie, even though the trailers tried to make it clear that this is a sequel to The Shining. I think most people just see that title and they're like, Dr. Sleep, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an unfortunate title. I mean, it, it was the title of the book, so. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fine title, but if you're trying to get a, a theater going audience to see a, a, it's not even really a soft reboot, but I think they were hoping for that kind of. Just call it The Shining or yeah. call it The Shining 2. No, you, they would just call it The Shining. That's really what yeah. they should, or, or no, Shining. Shining. There Get rid go. of the the, it's cleaner. Um, but it's, I think, a really interesting movie. We haven't talked about it yet. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I didn't think it was amazing. There's a, like a dated quality to it, which I love. I, I, I was going to say, that's what I liked about it. It felt very old fashioned. It felt very 90s. Mm. It didn't feel 70s. No, and that's important to point out is that this is not The Shining. This is not someone trying to make a Kubrick movie. Right. Uh, and that's to the movie's benefit because you can't do that. Uh, it's doing its own thing. It's an X-Men movie. It's, it's a very weird kind of different, it's not a very scary horror movie, although it has some of the more scarier scenes I've seen in a movie, or I should say disturbing yeah. scenes that I've seen in a movie recently. But um, yeah, there's sort of like a overemphasis on the, the powers and abilities of people with The Shining. So yeah. it really should have been called The Shining <laughs> instead of Dr. Sleep. But um, and it's funny too, because you and McGregor's the lead in it, and the way they talk about the Shining in this, sometimes it sounds like they're talking about the Force. Yes, and, <laughs> and there's there's that confrontation scene at the end with him and the bad lady and he's holding the ax, yeah. like a lightsaber, and he's like, are we ready to do this? <laughs> I, just I want, have the high ground. I wanted him to say that. <laughs> I bet you he said it like as an outtake. On set? Yeah. yeah. 
and just laughed. It's locked in the vault somewhere. And they all had a good laugh. When this starts, run. Yes, you run, dear. And then I will find you, and you will scream for years until you die. The dialogue is very confrontational, like in a in a science fiction uh, uh, superhero -y kind of way. Yeah. Because um, there's even like mind tricks, like Professor X would do. Like where you you don't realize where you're standing, Do -do 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 -do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then everything changes. <laughs> um, it's 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 a weird movie, and I can see it. Did you read the book? I did read the book. Okay, uh, and that's yeah. It, weird is the right word because it's it's a it's a adaptation of a book that is a sequel to another Stephen King book. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a sequel to the Stanley Kubrick Shining film. Right. Even though the Shining film and the Shining book are very different. And somehow this manages to be both, and most importantly, be a sequel to a Kubrick movie and not fall completely on its face. Yeah. But when I, when I first heard about the book, I think someone described it to me as like, oh, the little kid from The Shining, he grows up and fights vampires, which sounds like the worst, weirdest thing ever. And that's kind of what it is, mm -hmm. but it, it mostly works. They're humans. They're not supernatural. No. Um, but they, yeah, they, they, they feed off of our fears and off of our, and, right. and people with The Shining, it's even stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, but The Shining is sort of going away, they say, over generations. These yeah. people have been living for hundreds of years, but The Shining is not as strong as it used to be. Yeah. It's weird. It's like bringing this, and this is all in the original, uh, the original Stephen King book of The Shining. I mean, it's called The Shining, but in the Kubrick movie, everything's a lot more vague mm -hmm. as far as what The Shining is and what's, reality and what isn't and th this movie's a lot more it's a lot more mainstream it's a lot more s streamlined as far as the story goes mm -hmm. but it's also like we said very old-fashioned in a lot of ways it's very slow it's very mannered mm -hmm. uh it, it's technically a horror movie but it's more of a drama with supernatural elements which yeah. i liked yeah yeah it's a it's a bunch of different things um it felt like a very long tv movie Multi-part TV movie from the 90s? I, I think it probably would have benefited from being like a Netflix, because it's uh, Mike Flanagan who yeah. did Haunting of Hill House. And uh, I have read the book, and, and this the movie feels like condensed, of course, because it's a movie adaptation. Sure. It tried to be as faithful as possible, but still some of the elements felt rushed, mm. which is alleviated a bit. I did watch the director's cut, um, and that gives it a little more room to breathe. But yeah, I think as a three, four, five part series on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, it, it probably would have worked better and it probably would have reached a wider audience. So when I got that word of mouth, the way Haunting of Hill House did. Do they go to the, the Overlook Hotel at the end of the book? In the book? No. That's, that, that's, that felt very movie-ish. That's, that's the big deviation is uh, in the original Shining book, the hotel burns down. So in the Doctor's Sleep book, they go to the grounds where the hotel was. Okay. And that's where the big confrontation is at. Ah, okay. Yeah, the, the more it relies on the Kubrick movie, that's like the weaker aspects of this movie. It seemed more fan service -y, for lack of a better term. Like, yeah. Remember these ghosts? Exactly. It's sort remember of... the lady from the bathtub? And it's like, yeah. ah, yeah, no, I and just I, needed to see her once. I get it. Yeah, exactly. Like, but, when he first gets the overlook and he's walking around and, like, the lights turn on, I was like, oh, this is good. This is perfect. And I can understand the temptation to want to cram in, like, everything because there's so many iconic shots yeah. and images from that Kubrick movie. The one thing that was very sore thumbish was when Rose is walking and she just stops and looks and sees the blood elevator and then just keeps walking. It just keeps going. Uh, although I don't, I, I think that was just a random disconnected shot in The Shining. It wasn't something Danny visibly witnessed, right? It's yeah, it's just like a vision. It's just like a yeah. But I mean obviously but it's, it's not always real. It's people so. like making weird faces and, Yeah, and the shots are very disconnected. Very disconnected. So it, it's debatable whether or not that was in Danny's head, but but uh, Rose is our lead vampire. Yes. Vampiress. Yeah. Um, Rose the hat. Rose who, ha who wears a magician's hat and uh, uh, she leads a group of vampires from young to very very old. From young to lurch. From young to lurch. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like you said, uh, they killed Jacob Tremblay, which is a great scene. It's fucking horrific, but it's it doesn't feel gratuitous. It, it's uh, relevant to kind of making you understand like why all these creatures need to be put down. Yes, it's it, 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 normally they cut away from gruesome child murder. 
in movies, um, but this one they didn't, and it, it was very effective in making you hate these psychic vampires. Yeah. Well, and obviously, obviously the, the abuse of children is a running theme in the movie. In the movie. Danny, the little kid, now grown up to be Ewan McGregor, who is fantastic in the movie. Sure. Um, it was nice to see him in the lead. I think, like, other than the train spotting sequel that nobody wanted, I feel like he's mostly been supporting characters in the last, like, decade or so. He's the bad guy in the Birds of Prey film. Yeah. I've never heard of that film, uh, but I am interested in the Harley Quinn Birds of Prey movie. Oh, okay. <gasps> There's some pretty scary, weird, fucked up moments in this, like the opening when we see Danny and he's, he's, he's boozing it up at a bar, he gets into a fight, and he goes back to a lady's apartment, they're snorting cocaine, and he wakes up after a drug and booze-fueled night, and the lady threw up in her bed, and he sneaks out. And then he steals her money. And then he decides to steal her money because she spent all of his money on coke. Does he, in the theatrical cut, does he talk to Dick Halloran right after that? Yeah, well, okay. he's, a, he's in the apartment. Yeah, okay. He's like, I, I don't think, take a money from a purse. Yeah, I yeah. think his discussion is longer in the director's cut. Okay. That, that feels like the biggest difference is there's a couple scenes with Dick Haller in that uh, it, there's nothing like groundbreaking in the director's cut. It just kind of fleshes out yeah, longer, certain things. Yeah. Um, but he talks about in that scene, I don't know if it's in the theatrical, but Dick Haller in, because uh, Dan's trying to, his whole thing is like blocking out the, or closing the, the spirits from the Overlook Hotel in these kind of memory traps. Yeah. And he's trying to do that to this moment uh, of, of him stealing money from this passed out woman with a child. Oh no, Doc. You can put things from the Overlook away in boxes, but not memories. They are the real ghosts. You take them with you. And I was like, oh, that's a great line. I don't know if it's in the theatrical cut, but it's good. But yeah, again, there's a child in that scene. Lots, lots of, and like I mentioned, we mentioned the Jacob Tremblay scene. Like one of, that's one of the themes of the movie is kind of abuse of children. And even when the 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 true knot they're called, the traveling vat of vampire people, they pull up next to him after a baseball game. And yeah, they're like trying to get him to come into the van. It's not like sexual abuse, but it has that kind of connotation yeah. of like getting the van, little boy. Mm. Oh yeah. His dad, by the way, at the baseball game right before that scene, his dad is uh, the the kid that played Danny in the original The Shining. No shit. Never done another movie. He hits the ball every time, like he can read the pitcher's mind. I thought that was pretty neat because there was that was neat. he's one of those actors like he was in that he wasn't even really an actor. That's why Kubrick put him in the movie, to, so he'd feel more natural. Um, but where there's been like urban legends about him for years about what happened to him after The Shining. It's like oh he's just the guy. It works at the local True Value. <laughs> I think he's like a teacher or something. Weren't they saying Buckwheat? He worked at like a grocery store or something. Do you remember that? We found him at Smitty's Supermarket, where he's the most popular bagger for miles around. Hello there. How you all doing? Ah, one for me, hey? George, what was your reaction when you saw Bill English say he was Buckwheat on television? Well, my, my first reaction was, uh, uh, what? And I, I remember the kid from Wonder Years was Marilyn Manson, too. Oh, yeah. Urban yeah. legends. You gotta love them. That one turned out to be true, though. Like me. I don't know about magic. I always called it The Shining. Well, speaking of young Danny, I want to give this movie an A+, plus, a gold star. First place ribbon. Blue ribbon. Put it on the box for hiring actors to play the younger versions or the versions from The Shining um, and not sticking a fucking stupid CGI face on somebody. Yes. yes. I thought that was joyful. I, I thought everybody was good. I thought Jack was distracting. His accent wasn't right. The voice was right. It, well, they gave him, it's, uh, what's his face? Henry Thomas, the little kid from E.T. Oh. Because he was on uh, Honey and a Pill House, too. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, and, but they gave him, like, the Jack Nicholson hairline and the eyebrows, and he's doing, like, the Jack Mutton Nicholson chops. smirk. Like, that, to me, was distracting. Danny and Wendy were perfect. 
But oh, I, yeah. there's something about, I mean, Jack Nicholson himself is just so, like, specific and iconic that that I found distracting. It's, it's a cool. great scene. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the heart of the entire movie, and it's really, really good, but mildly distracted by the, the Jack Nicholson lookalike thing. You know, I'm, I'm okay with it because they shoot him mostly in profile, and he, he, his accent is, is, is sort of a mixture Mm-hmm. It's not really, it's not like someone doing a Jack Nicholson impression. And, and it, because that's one of those like, you know, famous impressions that people do. Christian um, Slater's built an entire career on it. Right. Um, so it didn't stand out as being, because people would have giggled. Yeah. If he did like, hey, you know, and started doing Jack Nicholson from The Shining. It's such an iconic performance. Yeah. And I think people would have giggled. So they said, tone it down. There were a couple of moments where it, peaked up here and there where it kind of sounded like yeah. him and the it, It's more visually for me where he looks like a celebrity impersonator because they do like the exact same hairline. Okay. And, yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's a great scene. Yeah. It's it's my favorite scene of the movie. And uh, Wendy is perfect too. The, the, whoever they got. That's Alex Esso is her name. She was the lead in that movie Starry Eyes. Okay. Oh, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I heard she was casting this as Wendy, I was like, that's fucking perfect. She but, looks exactly like her and she's a good actress. You, I mean, she's not as... Funny looking as Shelley Duvall, but <laughs> but she nailed the impression. Yeah. Well, they capture the, without doing impressions, they capture the kind of essence of the characters. Dick Halloran, too, is yeah. like, I, I almost forgot that I wasn't, like, he doesn't look like Scatman Crothers, but you still kind of get lost in that, the scenes. Yeah. Because um, he just captures that kind of essence perfectly. He looks a little bit like him, but... Um... But yeah, it's the, the tone of the voice and the, the performance. Yeah, the way he talks to Danny is great. The uh, starry eyes girl, probably. I just picture them watching, rewinding, rewinding <laughs> listen, listening to every. The way Shelley Duvall yeah. peaks her voice she oddly. Mo- she mostly sounds like herself, but when she. There's that part when uh, Danny's talking Danny, to Dick Halloran. Danny! Yeah. Danny! 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 Yeah. Danny! There you are! Where did you go? You scare me half to death. Um, but yeah, the uh, point being, no CGI faces of... That's the point. Yes. Is, is I've always, like, I don't know, when you see the movie and, and the show is a flashback, uh, I mean, they did it well in Terminator Salvagenesis, <laughs> whatever the fuck the last one was called. Dumpster Fire <laughs> Genesis. Uh, I don't know. What, what was it called? It was called Dark, Dark Fate. Fate. Dark Stool. Deep Fake. Didn't deep Fake. Deep That's fake? what we called it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it was, that was really good looking um, to the point where I was like, was that some kind of cut scene? Yeah. But that was pretty minimal. Like doing something where you have to have them perform like oh, in this yeah, movie, yeah. then it would have sucked. Yeah. But I just, I don't mind that. Like yeah. a different actor plays the younger version from, and they recreated some of the scenes, you know, Danny riding around on the, and they he, created a lot of the scenes, and even if it isn't directly recreating it, they're, they're evoking imagery from it. Well, early on, I wanted to mention uh, Ewan McGregor goes and talks to Bruce Greenwood, uh, the, the AA oh, leader. Oh, yeah, yeah. That scene that is, office. is yeah. shot exactly like the office scene when Jack is on his job interview. And, mm-hmm. and even the shots, and, the, and, the, and then the two chairs and the window over yeah. his head, and the American flag on the desk, and every, everything. The way it like, dissolves to the next scene. It early dissolves yeah. to the next scene, and it's just like... Yeah, su- subtler stuff like that, more so than the end of the movie. The where end it's was, just yeah. remember the shining yeah, over and over. It was a little, uh, that's why I said that. That's all not in the book. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just... I Keeping it more subtle, like maybe seeing the, the creepy woman from Room 237 and like that's it as kind of a visual representation of the entire hotel or something. Sure. Um, or just him walking around the empty hotel. I was thinking, there was, what a waste, like they built all these magnificent sets that look just like the sets from The Shining and t- such a small part of the movie. Yeah. But uh, it was also weird whatever. to me, like, and I don't know this, I think this has to do with just how they shot it, but like, yeah, it's it probably exacts like to, to the centimeter recreations of the sets, but they don't feel as big. And I think that's just like Kubrick loves wide lenses. Mm. So it all feels much larger. Sure. And in this movie, it, it's the exact same sets, but they, they don't feel as large. And I think it's just probably how it was shot. Yeah, that's another thing that may, I think made it feel a little dated was it felt very uncinematic, a lot of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate that. I like the Mike Flanagan. He has a visual style, but it's very subtle. He's not very show-off-y. And there's some really nice shots in this movie. Um, sure. The way they visually represent some of the elements of The Shining reminded me of like a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Like 
when Rose the Hat is in, what's the girl, Abra's bedroom. Oh, yeah. She's, like, looking through her memories, and we're seeing it visually as, like, giant filing cabinets going up to the ceiling uh, and stuff like that. I thought was really yeah. neat. Nah, I don't know. I don't get a strong visual sense. I, I kept watching scenes from this movie, and they, they kind of looked like, they look like a Netflix show, like mm -hmm. like really kind of like done quickly and flat. And I just picture, wanted more gritty, more m more contrast, more dynamic mm -hmm. images in a horror movie. It just very even haunting a Phil House. Haunting a Phil House is probably more visual than this, which is weird. Yes, that's um, what I mean. But yeah, I mean it's it's mostly character driven. You know, doesn't get flashy unless it needs to be. A lot of the dialogue scenes, to me, for a movie that tonally feels so different from The Shining, I still felt a connection between the characters yeah. from that movie and this movie, which is a pretty fucking big accomplishment. It is. It is. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a wise decision to change from the book, uh, as is often the case with uh, Stephen King adaptations. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta give it that uh, movie hook. Yeah. The movie is secretly about battling alcoholism. Yes. Because uh, he's like, yeah. He's that great like, scene in the AA meeting where he talks about how drinking kind of made him feel more of a connection to his father. Like, it's really well done. Right, right. Drinking and the temper and the anger, those things in me were his. And they were all I could know of him. The I dramatic mean, stuff in this is, is better than the horror stuff. As, as often in the case of Stephen King. That's true. This does have like a like a warmth and a humanity to it. It's like the polar opposite of the Kubrick movie since that's so like yes. cold and stark. Um, but I, I, I really wish the, the recent It movies were kind of more in line tonally with, with this. Mm. Not, and not goofy, evil dead vomit monsters. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this feels like more grown up. And Which more, is why it flopped. More of a, an adult watch at home. So this, this probably would have been a better Netflixy thing. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's part of the reason we're talking about it, I think it will have legs. Like, nobody saw it in the theater, but I think it's a, I think it's a really, it's not a perfect movie, but it's an interesting movie. And especially the fact that it's a sequel to a Kubrick movie that works as its own thing mm -hmm. and doesn't isn't like an, an embarrassing mess <laughs> is impressive. And I think I think it's an interesting story on its own too. Where right. hopefully this has some legs and more people will see it now. Yeah, that's the thing. Is is as for a sequel to The Shining, it it doesn't do it the way uh, the Hollywood brain would want it done. It's, right. It's, uh, well, Jenny's back. Watching over a different hotel yeah. with his wife and small daughter. <laughs> Oddly enough, I would recommend the director's cut over the theatrical cut. I think it, uh, it, it plays better uh, in terms of pacing. Because you're a film snob. I guess. You're a film snob who likes longer, more directory movies. You probably watch movies with subtitles. Speaking of which, have you seen Birds of Prey? This all started when the Joker and I broke up. It was completely mutual. It's Birds of Prey. I'm sorry, it's Parasite. The movie rednecks love to hate. Out of everybody in the United States of the motherfucking America, how many people actually fucking seen Parasite? Can someone please raise your goddamn hand and tell me? For the love of Christ, how many fucking people in the United States of the motherfucking America saw Parasite? I don't know what Parasite is. Parasite is about a poor family that moves into a rich family's house with the intention of conning them for much needed cash. From South Korean director Bong Joon-ho, it's the first film to win Best Foreign Film. It won Best Foreign Film. You know why? Because it's a goddamn foreign film. I'm sorry, Best International Film and Best Picture at the Oscars. What wonderful non-political speeches the director gave. After winning Best International Feature, I thought I was done for the day and was ready to relax. <laughs> At least he didn't act like Roberto Benigni. A moment uh, of joy, and I want to kiss everybody because you are the image of the joy. And uh, he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity sunrise, they said the poet. And this is wonderful to be here. 
We should point out we were planning to talk about this movie even before it won. Uh, I know. The, we were talking about doing this before the Academy Awards happened. We were, Jay. We've, so. We we watched this before it won all those Oscars. Yeah. I didn't even know it was nominated for as many because I, I hadn't paid any attention to the Oscars this I know, year. I know. Um, but it, it, it was nominated for a bunch and it won a bunch. It won a lot. Yeah. yeah. To me, a movie like Parasite kind of felt like an underdog. I was yeah. surprised it won as much as it did. I. I not in terms of the quality of the movie, because I think it's a great movie, um, but just in terms of like Hollywood standards and the type of stuff that usually wins Best Picture. It's usually something that's kind of safe, good, but safe. Yeah. And it's a movie that can win something like Best Picture at the Oscars, but can also appeal to someone like me that likes twisted, weird stories. Yes. Because yeah. it is that too. <laughs> It didn't feel like Oscar bait. No. Uh, it felt like he was trying to tell a story with, with a message in it without being, I guess it was a little overt, but um, without being too preachy or too like showy yeah. or look at me, look at me. This, well, is, this uh, is a weird story I want to tell. Yeah. A story that, I mean, obviously the entire movie is a metaphor for class and the difference between, between classes, but it's not... Like a like an American version of this, I picture it being so hitch over the head. Not that the the metaphor of the movie is uh, subtle; it's very obvious. But it's also vague enough where it can be universal. Yeah. Like like uh, I think that's why this movie is hit so hard is that so many people can uh, relate to what it's talking about, as opposed to something like Star Trek Picard. Which is like the uh, the writers liking the smell of their own farts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and even removing the metaphor from it, it's just a really entertaining story. Well, I mean, the history of the world has rich people and poor people, yeah. poverty and wealth, and rags to riches, and those kind of stories. The 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 what's the story where the the prince goes undercover as a pauper. Prince and the pauper, <laughs> is that it? <laughs> I don't know. This, this tale, this tale is old as time. <laughs> Kings and peasants and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And that's, that's, it's, 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 an, it's an old story. Yes. And it has nothing to do with modern uh, economics or pol politics. It's just a, it's a fairy tale. You, you, you can make connections to those things. Sure. And that's, that's when it works, is when it doesn't feel preachy or it feels like the... The, the filmmakers are talking down to you. Right. Uh, yeah, they're not or preaching pandering. Or pandering, yeah, yeah, yeah. preaching or pandering or trying to tell you to think this way or that way. It's just that's the two life circumstances of these, these two families. And that's what's great is neither of them are, they don't try and paint like the, the, the lower class families like, per, like they're frauds. Mm -hmm. and that's the entertaining part of the first half of the movie is them uh, scamming this rich family. But the rich family are not evil. Right. They're, they yeah. they have problems and they're they're very disconnected, but they're not evil people. Neither of them are evil. And yeah, you, you wonder who is the parasite. And that's that, the movie, that's yeah. That's the movie. Um and and yeah, it's a, it's twisted and fun and unexpected because I think the joy with Parasite is that, you know, I seen that poster and it's got the black bars and there's just like a family standing on the lawn and there's like dead body lying there. <laughs> You're and like, what is this? It's like that, that redneck was yelling in his, in his video vlog. I don't know what Parasite's about. I've watched that video what? multiple times and it makes me laugh and feel horrible every time. I'm sorry, if you won Best Porn Film, you should automatically be invalid to even be qualified to win Best Picture. Look at United States of America right now. What is more important to our culture than the Joker? About a movie about how people in high places look down and frown upon the poor, the poverty. This is America. This is United States America. You know that guy was originally getting so much hate on that video that he like uh, he privated it, but then I think he realized that it's the only video on his channel that's gotten any views. So, uh, in an in a act of pathetic desperation, he made it public again just so he could get more attention but who who gets angry over the oscars what, why would you get angry over what one but even if you really really loved a movie why would you get angry well in this case he was angry because it's political this is woke hollywood giving the award to parasite forget all these fucking social problems that joker touched upon let's have a better woke agenda and let's go full fucking woke I, i'm not exactly sure 
how the academy and all that works. It's a collective. It's like you're an academy member if you work in the industry, right? And then you vote. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming a lot of it is based on what people have seen mm -hmm. and based on word of mouth. And, and that, that's, that's, you know, that's when the, the faux outrage comes from you didn't nominate uh, this person, this person, this person. The, the, the nominations are not equally diverse of everything, yeah. right, right? And I think it's like we saw Parasite um, and we saw, you know, a couple other films. And, and I think a lot of it is just kind of like we didn't watch Parasite because we wanted to show how woke we are. <laughs> I don't think most people do. Well, that's what that's what I'm saying is yeah. that this guy's blog or whatever blog is is, is stupid. <laughs> right. Um, is because people see everything as like this group of like like five people in a hidden bunker, or a secret tower, going, ha, 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 here's what we're going to do. We yeah. are not going to nominate a woman this year. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like yeah. it's not. It's just what people saw. Maybe not so many people saw Little Women, right? Maybe, because uh, we saw Parasite based on like everyone going, Parasite, Parasite, Parasite. Yeah. This, well, it's this a really classic good. case of a movie catching on just from word of mouth. Word of mouth. From, you make yes. a really good movie and people will see it. And, and general interest. Ford versus Ferrari, I saw the trailer. I was like, that's kind of interesting, I guess. I don't really like cars or the history of cars, so I'm, I'm not going to watch it. Yeah. And then, Little Women, I was like, oh, another adaptation yeah, of Little Women. And so, yeah. you know, maybe that's kind of it, mm. you know, is, is just like who saw what. Yeah. And if you remember the Academy, if I was, I would make an effort to try and see everything mm -hmm. so I could vote as accurately as possible. But these were busy people and maybe they didn't see everything. Maybe everybody saw Parasite because everyone said, go see Parasite. And that's why it won <laughs> Best Picture. It's, it's like, it's not a nefarious, like, conspiracy. Yeah. Parasite, the first foreign language movie to ever win Best Picture. Well, I'm pat yourself on the fucking back, Academy. Go pat your woke ass fucking selves on the fucking back. I am sorry, this is fucking ludicrous. It's it's just uh, ridiculous to, to see who would get angry over the Oscars and what won. It doesn't affect your life in any way. No. You could still go see the movie. It's not like the, or <laughs> the best picture winner, all the other movies are deleted <laughs> from existing. It's like, what's the problem? I just don't know. Yeah, and and, yeah. and And I think it's great because uh, you know, there's that stigma, I mean, against average to below average intelligence people of, of subtitles and movies with subtitles. I watched the very first episode of a TV show called Los Spookies. Have you ever heard I've of this? I've heard of this, I think. It, it, it was a joyful first episode. It has Fred Armisen in it. Uh, it's all in Spanish. Mm. Uh, it's about these, you would really like it, actually. Okay. Because it's about this... The, the uh, Los Spookies, I think, means the Spookies. <laughs> it's this group of uh, kids. I've seen Spookies. Happy birthday, Billy. <laughs> but it's all subtitled. Hmm. All subtitled. And, um, you know, y y you look away for a second, you're eating your Kit Kat bar. <laughs> That you dip Is this in, how you eat Kit Kat? Well, I take a Kit Kat bar and I dip it in hot butter. Oh, of course. And I dip that yeah, in popcorn. Yeah, yeah. And then I drizzle caramel on that. It's a whole process. Uh, yeah. It's a whole process. So if I'm doing that, I look away from the TV and I miss five lines of dialogue. So you really, I like it in the foreign film setting where it's like, I'm going to watch a foreign film now that's subtitled. No. Not going to eat my Kit Kat bar. I have to pay attention to the film. butter covered in popcorn <laughs> covered in liquid caramel. <laughs> I can't do that when I watch a foreign film. Yeah. But it, like, so I, you know, I, I, I gave up on Los Spookies <laughs> um, because I'm like, I can't, I can't just constantly read the screen. Mm. I have to eat garbage food while I watch my programming, um, and I've got to sort of play with my cell phone. See, and, this sounds exactly like why that that YouTube guy was so mad about Parasite winning. But if I say I'm going to watch a foreign film. I'm gonna watch a foreign film and I'm gonna read all those subtitles. And Parasite is is definitely worth the watch because like I was I started off by saying the poster, weird poster, kinda of creepy. Weird. Did you did you I went into the movie not even knowing what the plot was. Same despite here. despite people saying like you gotta see Parasite, you gotta see yeah, Parasite. No I one did. said anything about what it was about. Yeah. That's I went the in thing. completely blind, which was the best way to see it. I knew there was a, a creepy element to it because of the poster, but 
No idea. Yeah. Um, I think I may have heard something about classism or, mm. See, I didn't or, know, or that. you know something like that. And I kind of knew that, but then watching it, no idea yeah. where it was going. And so it takes a pretty drastic turn about ha almost exactly halfway through because it's two hours. It's like right at the hour mark. Yeah. Um, Do we have to give away spoilers? If you've already seen it, yeah, you, you've wanted to see it and. If you don't want to watch a subtitled movie, then you're probably not going to be swayed by this review, so. But a film shouldn't be nominated for Best Foreign Film and then also have the opportunity to win Best Picture. Because none of the other Best Picture nominations had a chance to be nominated for anything else. This is America. This is United State of America. But the way, yeah, I mean, like, like we said, the, the kind of me, the, the class uh, messages of the movie are not particularly subtle, but they're, they're told visually. The way it tells the story is so much more interesting and nuanced than something like Joker. The framing of the window is sort of like the framing of a movie theater screen, which I thought was interesting. They go up Different, the stairs up to the get stairs. the rich people house. Yes. Yes, yes. And then the, the, the underground, the sub-basement. Windows and stairs yeah, are re reoccurring imagery. And it's, it's great. It's, it's, uh, and tonally, like, the first half is just really entertaining and fun. Mm. Them scamming this family. It, it was, I can't remember the last time I saw a movie where I was just, like, completely engaged in the story. Yeah. I feel like it's been a while where it's like, this feels, like, fresh and different, and I'm curious where it's going. Yeah, which is really why I don't want to talk about the story, mm. uh, um, because it's, it's a wonderful thing to watch unfold yourself. Yeah. It, and, and so, like, when, with, you know, Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> it's like the quote unquote story in that. We we'll talk about that all day. Yeah. Because people don't watch that for the story. They watch it for the spectacle. Yeah. Um, and this is this is, you know, a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, I mean it's not it's not the most complicated story. It's more about um, all the pieces that fit into it and how it unfolds. Yeah. And and all the little twists and turns. This is, I mean, the fact that this one best picture is like an example of, uh, you know, talking about people reading subtitles or whatever, where it's like, if you make a good movie, if you make an engaging story, it will reach people. Yeah. Uh, and this is a case of that. And I hope now that like maybe people that aren't familiar with Bong Joon-ho's other movies will go back and see like The Host or even Snowpiercer, which that's in English. It was, it was very nice to see his acceptance speeches because like we were talking before, he was very gracious, uh, very loving of film and filmmaking and filmmakers. He threw a you know, shout out to Martin Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino. Like, and then he said, and the other nominees, you're here too. I like your films too. <laughs> um, but you know, he didn't talk about not putting cow's milk in your coffee <laughs> and look like a rambling lunatic. And I think at times we feel or we're made to feel that we champion different causes. We're talking about the fight against the belief that we steal her baby, one nation, one people, one race, one gender, to artificially inseminate a cow. God, I'm full of so much gratitude right now. It's, it's like everyone who went up there and it was just like this sort of injustice, that sort of injustice, uh, blah, 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 blah. And you know, those things are important, but the Oscars, you know, they're getting $200,000 gift bags <laughs> and, and they're all rich and they're all like lecturing you yeah. and two-faced. Yeah. Uh, do, do, as, do as I say, not as I do kind of feeling, you know, whatever Joaquin Phoenix was rambling about. What wasn't he rambling about? I don't know. And, and like, okay, whatever. But it's, my point was, was that um, uh, Bong Joon-ho gets up there and he's just like, I, I love movies. And, and thank you, this is an honor. And, and then the Hollywood people get up there and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and a movie from South Korea won the Best Picture Award and beat out all the Hollywood people. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, and the movie itself is saying something that you know, is, is certainly political. 
uh, but he, but the movie speaks for itself. Yes. You know. Although really, he should be chastised for the very, very big lack of diversity in his movie Parasite. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they all lecture everyone about, you know, women. Women are great. All women are superheroes. True. Yep. Then they invite Eminem to perform. <laughs> And everyone's, everyone's dancing along to a man who has said the most misogynistic and homophobic things in his lyrics. Now, I like Eminem. <laughs> I do. And, uh, you know, I'm someone who says, hey, if you don't like it, don't listen to it, right? But they all go, they all go cross-eyed eventually. Yeah. Jo Joaquin Phoenix said something like, he's like, everybody sit down, sit down. Uh, and I do not feel elevated above any of my fellow nominees or anyone in this room. I'm not better than you. I'm not better than my other nominees. We're all the same. But all of you shut up and listen to me. Yes, <laughs> but I'm accepting this award at an awards show. <laughs> I am not better than anybody else, but listen to me rant for 20 minutes. I'm a, I'm a rich celebrity that played a comic book character. Let me tell you how to live. Let me I'm tell you about the evils of milk. Let's just recap by saying there are indeed injustices in the world, but Hollywood celebrities feel none of them. <laughs> Brie Larson upset that there, there are too many men reviewing movies is not an injustice. <laughs> an injustice is not being able to put food on the table for your fucking family or get medicine you need when you're sick. It's not that there's too many white guys reviewing Captain Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> These people are a joke. So, Jay, you ready to move to Hollywood? No! Start our film company? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were talking about Parasite. What are you doing? Oh, Bong Joon-ho has just announced to direct Birds of Prey 2. <laughs> There's some good uh, North Korean films too. Obey or Die. Oh, that's a good one. You know, yeah. my, me and my nuke, mm. America, the Devil Machine. You know, that's, they're all by uh, Kim Jong Un. Yeah, so they're all his films. Well, that's, speaking of you know filmmakers with an individual voice. Yeah. Obey or Die is one of the, the biggest films in North Korea. It's been playing in the theaters for ten years. Oh Number my God. one. Number one at the box office. Sure, sure. It, every showing is packed. Yeah. Every showing, every I showing. I mean, it's mandatory that they go, but... What? <laughs>